Welcome to Catholic Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. And before we start today's episode, I just wanted to um, preface this episode by saying thank you to my guests. From what you probably could tell from um, the title of the podcast, I'm actually uh, doing a follow-up interview with my friend Emily. Um, and a, if you go back into some of my past podcasts, the one that's titled... Um, from feminist to future nun, um, which I guess is a misnomer because she's actually a future sister. And at this point, a very soon to be future sister. Um, I did an interview with my friend Emily on her journey from uh, being a radical feminist to a uh, sister with the Dominican Sisters of Ann Arbor, Michigan, Mary Mother, Mother of the Eucharist. And um, before we start the episode, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to my friend Emily and tell her thank you very much for um, her hospitality. I went over to Chicago and we talk about our, my trip to Chicago a little bit uh, in the episode. And um, and I just wanted to say thank you to her and her family um, and uh, tell and um yeah. And so I hope you enjoy this episode. We talk a lot about uh, very Catholic things. So this is a very uh, Catholic high episode. We talk about um, the Eucharist. We talk about veiling. We talk about uh, ordination, uh, religious life, um, Mary, devotion to Mary, um, all these different things. So it was a great conversation. Uh, I know you'll enjoy it. Uh, let me know what you think about it, and um, and I'll get back to you about a few things that are in the works for Catholic Conversations um, in the near future. Uh, so stay, stay tuned for that. It'll be a lot of fun whenever it all starts uh, picking up. Um, and without further ado, I've taken up too much of your time, so let's jump into the interview. Welcome to Catholic Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca, and I'm here with my good friend, Emily Alcaraz, at her house in Chicago. Hi, Emily. Hello. Welcome to Chicago. Yeah, I, I came down to uh, visit you, uh, along with the Canons Regular of St. John Cantus over here in Chicago. And while I was here, I also uh, decided, you know, might as well stay and say goodbye to my wonderful friend, Emily, before she enters the convent. When are you entering? 21 more days on the Queenship of Mary, August 22nd. Yeah, today is August 1st and uh, while we're recording this, and uh, Emily will be entering August 22nd. So we're counting down the days before she will be locked in a cell. Um, it'll be great. I can't wait. So um, where what have you been up to since last time we talked? Not a whole lot, honestly. Super chill summer, just kind of saying my goodbyes to everyone. I went to... I. Last time we talked, I hadn't gone to pre-postulancy yet. And so while um, in July, I went to the convent in Ann Arbor for pre-postulancy, which is kind of like a test drive of the convent. So we were there for a week. 18 girls showed up. And at the end of the week, there were only 12 girls who made it. So it's kind of like survival of the fittest. They're like destroying people. And like, no, you were cut. You were kicked off the island, that kind of thing. That makes it sound really harsh, but it, it was, it was not, I mean, it was a little heartbreaking for some girls who were really set on it, but I think it was the right decision for everyone. They worked with us to make sure we we're making the right decision. Okay. And uh, so you were one of the 12 that made it through. Yes. Thank God. Yeah. Praise God. And so you, uh, so what was it like? What can you tell us about postulancy? I have to keep some of the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Part of religious life is the mystery of it. Um, but I can tell you, um, they pray a lot. The schedule of the day is basically goes something like this. Pray, eat, work, pray, eat, work, pray, eat, sleep. Wow. That is a full day. <laughs> yeah. You can, you'd be surprised at, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that one week I was there, I did more work than I probably had in the past month. Um, and so tell me, can you tell me the story that you told me about the uh, rings that you lost? Oh, yeah. Oh. So we were, the sisters have recreation every day. And one day for recreation, we decided to play softball. And so that I could bat, I took off my rings and I have these rings, you know, the rosary ones that have the bumps right, on them. Yeah, the rosary rings. Yeah, those. They sell them at every Catholic gift shop. I have those and um, I wear them every day and they're also third class relics of John Vianney and St. John Paul II and now a whole bunch of other saints. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But I took them off and I set them down in the grass. And after we played softball, we all went back inside. And I realized as we were walking back inside that I lost my rings. And so the sisters went back with me. And I, I, Sister Annie, one of the postulants, found out that I had lost my rings. And so they went back and got down. And I, I kept saying, guys, it's okay. Like, the the my re- third-class relics are now sanctifying the baseball field. Don't worry about it. I'll get new ones. It's no big deal. And I'm, it's not like I can keep them when I enter the convent anyway. But the sisters insisted on going back and finding my third-class relics for, <laughs> for me. And so they were, like, scouring the field for your rings? Yeah. <laughs> well, they did it when I wasn't there because I said, it's no big deal. Let's go. And they said, okay. But then later they came back and they're like, <laughs> we found them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So what did they do? Were they just, like, surprise you? They were just like, oh, we got them and just hand it to you? Yeah. <laughs> During one of the times when they could talk to me, because most of the day they keep silence. Oh, okay. Wow. That's awesome. So yeah, sisters, they're amazing. <laughs> yes. um, and then, so other than that, this summer, what have you been up to? I heard you went to Rome. Oh yeah. I hadn't gone to Rome yet. I was about to leave last time we we talked. It was amazing. Um, Rome. Wow. The Catholic capital of the world. The Vatican, I should say. It was amazing. Um, we saw... So many dead saints. Um, <laughs> and then uh, how did you like the, the churches? Stunning. What was we your need, favorite church? Oh, that's so hard. Um, besides St. Peter's Basilica. Okay, ruling out the basilicas because those are like obvious. I would say Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, I think it was called. It was a Dominican church. And it's the one where St. Catherine of Siena is. Oh, wow. She's there at the altar, at the main altar. And then on the, like the left side, there's Fra Angelico, who is also a Dominican painter. He he has a really famous painting called the Annunciation, or yeah, the Annunciation. And also some random guy who only Marissa and I knew, Capronica, because Father Dempsey told us about him. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was gorgeous. All the side altars were these massive Dominican paintings. So beautiful. Loved it. And so tell me about the, uh, you found uh, Ignatius of Loyola. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we uh, we knew because everybody, whenever you ask for advice when you're going to Rome, everyone is like, make sure to go see St. Ignatius at the Yezu, not at the St. Ignatius Church. I, like, that's the one thing everyone told us was St. Ignatius is not at St. Ignatius Church. <laughs> How odd. <laughs> I know. So we went to the Yezu um, to, to pray for the Jesuits. And... As we were leaving, actually, oh, that this was a funny story. We were walking out of the Yezu. We had just finished praying for the Jesuits, the salvation of the Jesuits. <laughs> for and, Father Jimmy Martin. Yeah, poor, oh man, he needs <laughs> prayers. And we had just left the church and I saw a Dominican habit. And of course you see all kinds of habits in Rome, but this one I recognized. And so I started running after the sister and she was already like a ways away, but I started chasing after her. <laughs> and I said, sister, sister. And she turned around and, and sure all enough, 500 sisters around. Right. Turned. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, she turns around and she's got the medal. And I recognized it. It's the, the Dominican sisters of Mary, mother of the Eucharist. They all wear this medal of Mary. She's like kneeling down and holding up the child Jesus. Like she's playing with him. And that's the group that you're joining. Yeah. That's my community. And she turned around and I saw the medal. And so I ran up to her and I was like almost out of breath. And I didn't know what to say. So I just said, I'm entering in August. And I just saw her face light up and she was like, no way. (laughs) (laughs) And so we, it was, it was so like, it was providential. That's awesome. Yeah. And so she invited me to go to Vespers with them the next day, which I did. And it was awesome. Oh, that's so great. Mm -hmm. And uh, so does that mean that you're technically Sister Emily already? I don't know when it becomes official. Oh, okay. You can call me Sister Emily if you want. (laughs) Um, Okay. So to this this week I was in with the canons. The canons are actually pretty cool. So the canon was regular St. John Cantus. They're a very interesting group. They're like a cross between like a normal diocesan priest and the fraternity of society St. Peter. So they both they both do the Trinity Mass and the Latin Novus Ordo Mass, which I think is really interesting. So they uh, I met with the guys, are really cool. And then when I was done, um, I had the uh, pleasure of staying here with you and we explored Chicago a little bit. And one of the high Highlights of my week had to be that uh, me and your one of your little brothers and one of your little and your little sister uh, went to go see uh, Venerable Fulton J. Sheen. Uh, wasn't that awesome? It was so much fun. We did. We took the road trip about three hours to Peoria, Illinois. Got to see the Cathedral of 
of St. Mary of the Immaculate Conception, which was gorgeous. It was, oh my gosh, it was absolutely gorgeous. I was like looking up in the sky. They have a painted in like this moon and the stars and it's gorgeous. And then the the tomb of uh, Fulton Sheen is there. It's amazing. So cool. He's one of my favorites. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so we, on our journey, we decided to stop at the Fulton J. Sheen Museum and we get there and we get out and we see closed and we're like, what? So we go and check out the door. And there's a sign that says that the person who was running the museum had died. And I was like, well, that's, in- <laughs> that's inconvenient. <laughs> and so uh, one of the people who were a neighbor, who were well, their neighbors came out and was like, oh, yeah, she died like two weeks ago. And, <laughs> and I was like, oh, well darn <laughs> i don't know what to say we drove like, three hours to get here <laughs> like, how, how rude of her <laughs> uh, no but um yeah so we were like peeking through the window and i was like looking through and i saw fulton sheen's uh chalkboard that he was uh, famous for drawing on so fulton sheen is like one of my favorite saints so that was awesome yeah um so yeah that was that was one of my highlights of uh the week um yeah. and that, that was in el paso illinois not el peoria pa- yeah that's right that was in el paso illinois not texas no, El Paso, Illinois. Um, and what else did we do this week? What else did we do? Oh, well, we took a super chill day yesterday. We went to Lincoln Park Zoo, played football. That was fun. I won, by the way. <sighs> yeah. <that's right. laughs> and and then uh, then we, we visited. Uh, oh, we visited one of the churches and heard a fire homily. Oh, oh my gosh. yeah. We trekked all over the city. What day was that? Two days ago. Monday. Yeah, that's right. On Monday, we trekked all over downtown Chicago. That was amazing. And then we ended the day at one of the churches. I don't know if you want to uh, call out anyone, but the church was uh, really, oh my gosh, Polish church, beautiful. And the priest there gave one of the firest homilies I've ever heard. He was just like, there's infiltration in the church, um, but don't lose hope. Uh, at the end, everything will be good. But you remember that whenever Jesus comes again, will he find faith on earth? And you're just like going at it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Veritas. Uh, yeah. A really holy priest. Not going to call him out because it wouldn't be good for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was like, he was like, yeah, I've been reported already, uh, but <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do it again anyways. <laughs> so uh so yeah that was uh so that was a lot of fun that was really cool and then uh we did adoration afterwards um and then he started talking to us after adoration it was just i like, kept going um, yeah. and then we chased him down and he gave you the most amazing blessing ever oh yeah it was that beautiful. was really cool um okay to switch gears a little bit to talk about uh to move from talking about uh the fun we've been having to uh something more a little bit more theological I wanted to talk to you about um, veiling a little bit uh, because you said you were, ta- we were talking and, I was, and we were like talking about um, how we think that uh, some of the ideas about veiling have become more sentimentalized rather than, um, I don't know, what, what would you say about it? Yeah, I know you already did a podcast episode about veiling, but there was just some stuff that I wanted to add because this is something that I've been researching and looking into probably for three or four years now since I started veiling. And what I've noticed is that whenever you ask a woman why she veils or why she doesn't veil, she'll give you a very sentimental and emotional answer. And that baffles me because veiling is not like a, and it's not an emotional issue. It's not a subjective thing. And I think a lot of women don't understand that. So one of the first references we see to veiling is in scripture 1 Corinthians chapter 11, St. Paul, and right before this, he writes one of my favorite lines, hold fast to the traditions just as I handed them on to you. So, well, so I guess that means that we should um, keep on doing traditions. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So Paul was not a Protestant, clearly. Anyway, after that, he writes... Any man who prays or prophecies with his head covered brings shame upon his head. But any woman who prays or prophecies with her head unveiled brings shame upon her head. For it is one and the same thing as if she had her head shaved. And he goes on and on sort of repeating the same thing. So men should not wear hats in church. That's one thing. And I bring that up because uh, my pastor actually got really upset one day because um, we were doing the during mass. Um, and you know, we say mass ad orientum, so he doesn't see what people are doing. And he turns around at the end of mass and he sees someone wearing a hat and he's like, um, excuse me, sir, please take off your hat. 
And the guy just didn't to take off his hat. So he told him three times to take off his hat. So yeah, guys should not be wearing hats inside of a church. And I feel like that's pretty common knowledge. Like most people know that they should not be wearing hats in church. But what people don't know, everyone skips over this part, is that women should be veiling. It's right there in scripture. Paul said it. We know that Mary was a Jewish woman and veiled when she went into the temple because she was a good Jewish woman. And this is only the first reference, but if you go on, many of the church fathers wrote about this. Yeah. And in fact, the, uh, and so, yeah, we're going on with that though, with hats, um, women can wear hats in a church. So they can, if uh, there are a lot of women will wear uh, very nice uh, sun hats or something similar uh, instead of a traditional or uh, what we see nowadays as like a veil over the, uh, that we wear over your hair that is more like a lace um, a hat is also perfectly acceptable to wear for a woman, um, though nothing should be covering the head of a man. Yes. And if you look in most churches, if they're built properly, they will have a statue of Mary somewhere in the front. Unfortunately, Holy Name Cathedral, as we saw this week in Chicago, does not have a statue of Mary. <laughs> kind of. I was there at the I was looking around and there was this weird uh, statue, like a metal statue that had a bunch of like angels or demons, not sure which, that were just flying around. And then this pseudo woman looking thing that was also standing in the center. And I think that may have been Mary, but I'm not 100 percent sure. <laughs> no, that's the zombie apocalypse chapel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. That church um, has a lot of potential. It's surprisingly ugly, though. Yeah, Holy Name Cathedral, it could be so beautiful. Ugh. Yeah, that's the, that's the cathedral in Chicago, Illinois. Not Chicago, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So after Paul, John Chrysostom, Ambrose, Augustine, and Thomas Aquinas all write about women and how they should veil. So these are some of the most, and these are just the ones that I could find in the little research that I've done. Um, these are some of the greatest teachers that the church has ever known. And all of them write about the necessity of women veiling in church. But isn't that just the patriarchy? Like, come on. Oh, so sexist. So isn't there, is there any women saints who say it? <laughs> uh, not that I know of, although obviously you have you know, Edith Stein and female saints writing about the feminine genius, which all ties into the theology of veiling. Yeah. Every woman saint wore a veil. Pretty yes. much. Like 99% of women saints veil. I don't know of a female saint that didn't veil. Let me think. Nope. Can't think of anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. Um, but yeah, even the saints that were not sisters were mothers during the time where they would have veiled. So they would have veiled. So yeah. Yeah. All women, all women saints have veiled. Well, would you look at that? Weird, isn't Weird. it? Weird. <laughs> Let's see. What do these all have in common? Let me think. Connecting the dots. One, two, three. Ah, I get it now. Okay. <laughs> so moving on to uh, something a little bit different. Um, when we talked about, we uh, talked a lot about the um, hope of the uh, living our life as if tomorrow is going to be the day that Jesus comes. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. That's right. Because that's... Um a topic that the priest touched on that we went to that, that super fire homily on yeah. Monday night. We talked about that a little bit and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's really funny that he brings it up because I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, about like, will he, will Jesus find faith on earth when he returns? Will the son of man find faith on earth? And it seems as though they're so, um, it looks so desolate sometimes where there's like nobody who believes anymore and everyone just wants to make themselves God. But, at the same time, um, there are so many people around that are so faithful and we look at religious orders and they're so young. Um, and so there's hope in that. Yeah, I have a lot of hope, but at the same time, you know, checking off the boxes, okay, weekly mass, monthly confession, that's not enough. Like the bare minimum, like if that's all you're capable of, then okay. But s s most people are capable of so much more and most people live lukewarm lives without the full potential of, of zeal that they should have. Yeah. So do you, what do you think? Um, what do you think is the cure for this? Eucharistic adoration, um, consecration to Our Lady. There's so many things that I feel as though we we don't we don't promote anymore as a as a community things that kind of just died out and we uh, just kind of let fall to the wayside we don't have uh, people do consecrating themselves to our lady we see that as like a superstition or see that as uh as irrational devotion to mary um like 
I, I just find it maddening to think of, uh, of these these uh, great practices that have been around the church that are falling by because of intellectualism. Yeah, well, as a Dominican, I see this as a lack of veritas, a lack of truth, because people don't know what they're missing out on. If people knew what adoration was, if people knew what the power of the rosary, they would never stop. They would never leave. Yeah, I was uh, making the joke while we were, uh, I was praying the rosary and you're like, hey, we were going to pray the rosary together. And I was like, I was like, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was going to make the joke, but I was like, it's probably inappropriate inside of a church. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I pray the rosary would have nothing better to do. So I pray here all the time. <laughs> There's nothing better to do. Literally. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, it was amazing to, to, to be able to see. Uh, so many people at adoration at, at um, the church that we were at. Uh, so many people there uh, pretty late at night. We were there at like nine o'clock at night or something like that. And um, there are a lot of people there. There was probably like 15, 20 people uh, there for Eucharistic adoration. It was amazing. Yeah. And another thing that the priest said that really stuck out to me, because we just watched the Lord of the Rings movies. We had a marathon with my family. And father mentioned this line where... Frodo's sort of complaining and he's saying, why did I have to be born at a time like this? Mm. And we could reflect that question because mm. when you look at the church and the scandals and the abuse and all the trouble and corruption that we have, you could ask, why me? Why did I have to be born right now? And right. some people, when they're faced with that question, they're, co they're cowardly and their decision is to leave the church and to run away rather than to run in. But Gandalf's response to Frodo is to say, we don't get to choose what time we are alive in. We only get to choose what we do with the time we're given. Yeah, that is a amazing quote. Yeah, because uh, to think about it, like how... Like I, it really is pretty easy to, to sit here and say, man, I wish I was alive during like, I don't know, the time of Thomas Aquinas, or I wish I was alive whenever, uh, whenever the council, of, the catechism of the council of Trent was published and doctrine was so clear, or I wish I was alive during this time period, this time period, why would I have to be born now when things are so bad, when it's so out there in the open? Um, and yeah, you're right. Like that is something that we have no control of. We can't, uh, re-enter our mother's womb and be born in another time. Um, the only time we could be born again is in baptism. Um, too late. I already, I already, I already did that. <laughs> Darn. Um, so, uh, other than that, we have to deal with the time we have. We are born in a, in a time and a place and we have to go out and we have to, uh, fight the battle. We have to, uh, leave the Shire and go out and go and, uh, try to slay the, slay the beast, uh, you know, face, um, what is it? Um, smog. Guess, yeah, there you go. Or, no, or not smog. Mor I'm thinking of um, Mordor. No. Sauron. Sauron. There you go. <laughs> We're the Dang, worst. My Lord of the Rings references are so bad right now. Um, <laughs> Time to reread the books. <laughs> Emily's brother's like, oh my gosh. They're shaking their head. They're like, I cannot believe y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all forgot the name of the character. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, it, it is a really good point. We have to, um, it's good to reflect on our death. It's good to reflect on uh, tomorrow. Um, what, what will be tomorrow be like? Um, we can't make these 10, 20, 30, 40 year plans, um, and be like, I'll be holy tomorrow. I'll be, I have a 10 year plan to be holy. Um, we have to be holy now because what if Jesus came tomorrow? Yeah. So sometimes what that means is entering the convent, even though you haven't finished getting your degree, or that could mean wearing a veil, even though you don't understand why, the church has that tradition, but trusting the tradition of the church that is so ancient and so wise. Yeah. I mean, how, uh, if we can't, if we have to trust the church, um, even if the, there's so many bad things and so many, uh, bad prelates in the church, we have to trust the traditions of the church because if not, um, who can we trust? Uh, we can't trust anything then we can't even trust the scripture itself because who put the scripture together except the, the, the church itself. Um, so it's really all or nothing. It, it is the church or it is nothing at all. Um, the Protestant church is inconsistent within itself to be able to be a sola scriptura, um, though some Protestants would disagree with um, my definition of sola scriptura. But, you know, the typical view of what it is, that's what it is. That's what most Protestants think it is. Yeah, self-interpretation um, of scripture. Right, exactly. And that makes no sense. The No one had, would have ever thought of that until today. Um but no, we have so much, uh, so many hopes though. There's so many hopes that we have because Our Lady of Fatima said at the, at the end of all these apparitions, at the end of saying that the whole world is going to be terrible, at the end of saying, uh, showing the kids hell and all these other things, uh, Our Lady said that in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Amen. 
Yeah. Um, though that that may sound sketchy to some people who are like, "Oh, Mary is a boogeyman," or we shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't, we don't worship Mary. That sounds uh, scary, but. Like what is it? What does it mean to have a devotion to Our Lady? Devotion to Jesus, exactly. And so, same thing. Uh, yeah, exactly the same thing. Uh, there's a great saying from John Paul II, which was what? Totus tuus. Totus tuus. <laughs> yeah. And so it was uh, totally yours, Mary. And it was it was a sacrifice. You were giving yourself to Mary. And that sounds like what on earth? What? Why would you do that? Um, but because Our Lady, what did she do but direct us to her Son? And so if we give ourselves to her most fully, she'll give us to her son in a more perfect way. Um, so don't be afraid to give ourselves, give yourself to Mary um, because all she'll do is make anything that you do. She'll turn it perfect. She'll make it beautiful and she'll present it to her son on a silver platter uh, something that you can't do. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, if Jesus is the mediator of God and man and Jesus, uh, we have to go to Jesus in order to get to the father. Um, how much more uh, do we need a mediator between us and Christ? Uh, and Jesus himself. And who else could be that mediator except for the mediatrix of all graces, which is Our Lady. Our, we go to Our Lady and she brings us to her son. Um, and so there has to be someone who brings us to someone who is God. There's an infinite division between us and God. And Our Lady being her, his mother uh, can bring us uh, to him. So I think that's just a beautiful way to look at wow, it. Wow, have you have you read True Devotion to Mary? Uh, you know, I've actually been reading the, that book recently. <laughs> no uh, way, I couldn't tell. I, I, I don't know how you would have guessed that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's not like we talked about it earlier. <laughs> no, yeah, True Devotion to Mary is an amazing book and I highly recommend anyone who uh, would like to grow a relationship with Mary to read it. Or if you are skeptical about devotion to Mary, uh, read this and read it all the way through. Don't like read the first 10 pages. If you do, you're going to be like, uh, this is pretty weird, but read through the whole thing. And if you're, and if you read through the whole thing, you will be like, okay, I understand now. And then you can uh, make a decision on what to do. Um, but you have a devotion to Mary. Can you share that with us? Yeah. So as a sign, and we were talking about this earlier this week. And because, this will be controversial. Yeah, this might be controversial, <laughs> but as a Sorry, sign, <laughs> <laughs> same <laughs> as a sign of my own consecration to Mary. While I was in Florence a couple months ago, I got a tattoo on my arm that says totus to us written in the handwriting of St. Pope John Paul II. And the reason for that is because in true devotion to Mary, St. Louis de Montfort says that encourages you to wear an outward sign of your consecration. And so as a sign of my consecration, I used to get the little chain bracelets, right? Which symbolize your slavery to Mary and Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I kept losing them or they kept breaking because they were like dainty and thin and cheap. And so I decided to get a sign of my consecration that I couldn't lose or break. <laughs> so I got a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so my first reaction when I saw Emily's tattoo, it was like, Oh my gosh, Emily, I cannot <laughs> I believe knew, I knew that. you wouldn't I like it. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. So um, it's not a secret. I'm not a huge tattoo fan. I don't like tattoos. Um, I don't think they, I don't think they look good. Uh, I have, yeah, I don't like tattoos, but after thinking about it, I was, I, I was reading true devotion and I had just gotten to the part about him talking about external signs of our lady of a devotion to our lady. And he was taught. And he also talked about how, um, we should be slaves to our lady in the uh, equal to a, a animal of burden, um, willing to having uh, our life rest in the balance of our master. Um, and then in the same way you were talking about how you were branding yourself for our lady. And I was like, and I was like making all these connections and I was like, Oh, I was like, Oh, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Actually, this sounds pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you should name this episode, how to freak out a Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This episode is not a Protestant friendly. <laughs> this is uh, a, this is Catholic galore. <laughs> no. Papists only. <laughs> we're talking about popes, bishops, uh, priests, um, Church uh, scandal, uh, Marian consecration, <laughs> veiling <laughs> sisters and Convents. nuns. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> this is great, but, um, yeah, so she got, so I, I was thinking about this stuff and I was reflecting on it and I was like, okay, you know what? 
Actually, I can't think of a theological reason why tattoos are inherently wrong. Usually the thing people say is like, oh, you shouldn't uh, mark up the body because your body's a temple. But if you're marketed of something holy, what's wrong with that? Um, because uh, we do a lot of things like with uh, that would be like saying, I don't know, I wear a miraculous medal around my neck all the time, 24 seven. And uh, that's a sign of my devotion to Our Lady. Would it be so bad to have it permanently on me? It's already permanently on me. Can it be permanently on my skin? Like, what's wrong with that? Um, I couldn't think of a reason why it's actually wrong. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I still don't like it. I still don't think it's good. I don't, I don't like it. But then uh, thinking about your tattoo specifically, I was like, okay, if you're tattooing yourself, saying you're devoted to Mary, and in this certain way, it's actually quite beautiful and pretty awesome. Um, and I, we had, it's funny because uh, you brought it up and, uh, and I was like, and I told you while we were eating, I was like, don't tell anybody that I said this though, <laughs> <laughs> because, um, uh, because I was like, I was like, cause I've been saying that I don't like tattoos my whole life. And now I just admitted to you that I was like, okay with your tattoo. And I was like, don't tell anyone. And then you bring it up on the podcast. This is and the so only everybody, exception. So now everybody can know. So sorry, mom. My bad. <laughs> oh. oh, and you're, uh, oh, and before. Before I forget, uh, your brother wanted me to uh, bring up that while we were over to go see Venerable Fulton Sheen, uh, he brought with him a Lego piece of a priest. So they have a Lego set for priests. So if you are a mom or a sister or a brother and you want to get a gift for your siblings that like Legos, they have Catholic Lego sets that you can buy with uh, a high altar with priest uh, Legos, Lego pieces. So he brought his uh, his Lego man, who is a priest, and brought him to Venerable Fulton Sheen and put the the priest uh, <laughs> Lego onto the uh, onto the casket of um, of Venerable Fulton Sheen, and so now. Uh, his his priest is a third class relic, <laughs> and not only that, not only that, but we went into the reliquary, uh, the reliquary, and uh, the chapel, and there were about four hundred saints in that room, and he went through and meticulously placed his, his Lego man, his Lego priest, onto every single one of the saints, and so now, not only. Is his Lego piece a third class relic of Venerable Fulton Sheen? He's also a third class relic of nearly every other saint. <laughs> so we were like, so uh, you cannot throw this thing away ever. <laughs> we're like, sorry, you you have to keep your uh, your priest uh, with you for forever. So he's going to be twenty one day, and he's going to have this Lego piece. And he's going to be walking around. And he's gonna be like, guys. Do I have a story to tell you? <laughs> we so, should make him a chain to wear it around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> wear the priest around his neck. That'd be amazing. So uh, he wanted he wanted me to tell the story. And I was like, oh, yeah, I completely forgot about that. That is a great story to tell. So with his permission, that is the his story. <laughs> um, so that was a lot of fun. So we had a lot of fun this week. And I really enjoyed. Thank you very much for allowing me to stay with your family. It's been a joy and an honor. Um, Thank you for coming, Adrian. We had <laughs> such an emotional goodbye in Houston. I know. I thought it was going to be like the last time I saw you. I was really sad because I was like, oh, I can't, I can't believe because uh, you were going to Rome. And then uh, as you were coming back, uh, I was leaving like the day before you came back to Poland. And so I, we completely missed each other. And then you went back to Chicago and I was like, darn it, I'm never going to see her again. And so I uh, was I it was very happy to find out that I was able to uh schedule a week and come to Chicago, uh, spend some time with the Cannons, and then spend some time with you and your family. And her family has been a joy and a f lot of fun. And they're all surrounding us right now. And I can, <laughs> I'm looking around and uh, they're all doing different things. One's reading a book, one's playing with Legos. Actually, all the three of them are playing with Legos. Um, we really like Legos. I don't know if you can tell by the, <laughs> by the, the story. <laughs> the layer of Legos on the, on the ground over here. Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, and so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, and the, your, your, I, I just love how um, Catholic your your household is. It's just like it just oozes out of everything. Everybody just wants to, That's what they're talking about. Even the, the kids who are like um, 12, five and a half uh, and every other age in between um, there. It's, it's really nice. It's really nice to see. Yeah. Thank you. And my family is the reason I know that I have a religious vocation because they are in many ways such a perfect family, like so wholesome, very devout, very pious and faithful, loving. We all get along most of the time. 
Yeah, when they're not hitting each other with pillows. And to see, yeah, yeah. And to, <laughs> to see how good our family um, dynamic is and to still desire a religious vocation instead of marriage and a family, that's how I know it's real because mm-hmm. I'm not running away from family life because I had a bad family life. I had the best yeah, family life. Yeah, your family's life. awesome. I was like, oh, we were talking, I was like, our parents would get along so well. Yes, <laughs> our, parents are our so moms similar. are so similar. Our dads are similar. Yeah. Even our siblings are similar. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Um, so yeah, that, that was pretty awesome. And um, that reminds me, I heard that your siblings want to join religious life too. <laughs> All of them except for one. Yeah, I heard. I uh, may or may not had, have had something to do with that. Yeah, and uh, your little sister said she wants to be a sister too. Yes, I do want to be a sister too. My name is Alicia. And I'm... Five and a half. I'm five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so she... Uh, she, uh, you took her to, um, a, what did you take her to? And then you had to fill out the, uh, Oh, so I'm doing, I'm doing one of the postulants recommended that I do a last, a final sibling date with each one of my siblings. So take them somewhere by themselves and just spend a day with them. And so my little sister, she's five and a half, uh, as you heard. So we went to the American girl cafe in downtown Chicago and we took the American girl doll mine. So she's super old and, and janky now. <laughs> And we had tea at the cafe and they gave her this handout where it had these, it was like a questionnaire. And one of the questions was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she wrote a nun. She (laughs) she had asked me how to spell it. (laughs) (laughs) That's so great. Uh, I saw it on your fridge and I was like, that's so cute. Oh my gosh. And uh, Pablo uh, said he wanted to be a priest. And I asked him, um, I said, uh, so how how are you going to say mass when you were, when you become a priest? Pablo, come here. Uh, <laughs> how are you going to uh, say mass when you become a priest? Uh, it's going to be ad orientum. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Awesome. No girl alter, altar servers. No girl altar servers. What else? Um, There's going to be an altar rail. Who's going to do the readings? A uh, man. A man. Oh, wow. Awesome. No woman <laughs> on the altar. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. So the uh, the religious vocations in this house is booming. Your your parents are going to be saints. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. So this was a wonderful conversation. Um, I wish that I could talk to you uh, for another two hours. But my flight is leaving in uh, two hours, uh, so I can't talk for two hours. You already missed your first flight on the I way did. here. I, uh, so on my way here, I woke up late and I missed the flight. So I was like, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> I woke up and I saw your text and I was like, well, darn, I guess Adrian's not coming anymore. <laughs> so I hopped on the next flight in and I still got to Chicago. So my, uh, I, need, I need to get to the airport at 845 and it is currently 825. So I still have time. Uh, I have plenty of time. Okay. Uh, so the um, so yeah, we'll just close out. And um, any last things, thoughts, que- um, or anything like that you'd like to say? For everyone listening to the podcast, please pray for me. Um, two requests. Pray for me in my vocation that I do God's will and pray for the sanctity of all priests. And another thing, pray for Adrian, my good friend. Pray for my family and I will pray for all of you from inside the convent. Awesome. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, it's been a absolute joy. I've loved it. I loved every second of it. Um, and uh, when will I be able to talk to you again? Well, you can write me letters whenever you want. Right. But when will I be able to talk to you again? If all goes well, I'll visit home again in a year. I'll find my own, my old phone, look up your number, unless it's changed. Don't change your number in the next year. And I will call Adrian. You'll, you'll hear my voice again in a year. Awesome. So yeah, so you spend one year and you won't be able to, um, and for that year, what is it going to be like? So postulancy is sort of like a spiritual internship. So I'll be following the sisters around, living their lifestyle, not fully a part of the community yet, but just testing it out. I won't be wearing the full habit. You'll be wearing an ugly pantsuit. Oh, it's so ugly. It's not a <laughs> pantsuit, but it's the uniform. It's ugh, hideous. <laughs> but e- yeah. Each of the shoes weighs about five pounds. But <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So what do you get to bring with you to the convent? What do you, what's on the packing list? Only what is necessary. So just the clothing, 
and some books that are on the syllabus because we're this year we're going to be studying the documents of Vatican II. Interesting. Um, yeah, I know. We'll see. <laughs> you know, I've never actually read them, so this will probably be good for me. Okay. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, we will close out in a Hail Mary as usual. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed art thou among amongst women, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, womb Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour, hour of our death. death. Amen. Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, pray for pray us. Pray for us. Uh, our Lady, Seat of Wisdom. Pray for us. Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Again, I wanted to uh, thank you for uh, listening to the podcast. And uh, and the interview with Emily was a amazing interview, and I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, lo- re- listening to it, I was like, oh, wow, it's crazy, because she enters as of the time of uh, me posting this and uh, less than a, a week away. So she is entering very, very soon. And, um, and so it'll be it, – I'm excited for her. Uh, so please keep her in your prayers. And I know – um, that she will be praying for uh, this ministry that I'm doing here. And so that means he's praying for everyone here that's listening. Uh, so, um, yeah, please keep her in your in, her, in your prayers. Um, and other than that, I wanted to tell you about a uh, Instagram account that uh, me and Emily just started. So Emily is going off to convent. And Emily is, um, is a very avid um lover of memes, we could say. And so we uh, decided to gather all her memes she's created over the past few years into one place. And I'm going to start posting all her memes um, for the next year or so on Instagram under the um, meme page called Our Lady of Memes. So if you look up Our Lady of Memes on Instagram, um, as of uh, today, there should be only two pictures posted. Uh, we're going to post them, uh, one picture every Saturday in honor of Our Lady, uh, every Saturday until uh, we run out of memes, which should be about uh, a few, maybe a year, a little more than a year. So about a year worth of memes. It'll be great. So uh, I would recommend you go to Instagram, look up Our Lady of Memes and follow that Instagram account. Also, I am now posting these uh, podcasts on YouTube for people to listen. Now, for right now, I'm just um, slowly uploading all the backlog until I catch up with uh, today. So every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'll be uploading some old episodes of uh, Catholic Conversations until we catch up um, with today. And then from then on, I'm going to start adding in graphics, um, quotes, anything that we talk about. I'm going to try to add a visual element. So for people who want to uh, sit down and watch the episodes. They can see the references whenever I say uh, Fulton Sheen said. I can um, pull up where he said that and show y'all uh, the quote. Or if I'm talking about a trip I went on, um, like in this episode, we're talking about a trip to Peoria. Maybe I can show a picture of um, Fulton Sheen's tomb um, and things like that that we saw while we were there. So uh, that that kind of element is something that I'm trying to develop. It's uh, it takes a lot of time, um, but it's a, I think it's fruitful, and I hope that uh, you will enjoy it. So uh, check out Catholic Conversations on YouTube. Slowly, I will be adding it there. Um, and if this is your first episode you're listening to, and you want to start from scratch, uh, Catholic Conversation on YouTube, we only have posted about three episodes as of the release of this episode. And so I'll be releasing three a day, three a week, every week until I'm caught up. And so that'll be about six weeks before I'm caught up. Um, other than that, uh, as always, like, share, um, subscribe to the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, whether that's TuneIn, Stitcher, um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anything in between, Stitcher. Uh, I think I said that already, Uh, but also on YouTube, go to YouTube and subscribe to Catholic Conversations on YouTube. Uh, Leave me a five star review. If you enjoy the podcast, share it with someone that you think would find this fruitful. Um, And uh, as always, uh, we'll close out in a Hail Mary in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, e benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pra nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. And one last note. I want to say, uh, a, a immortalize this goodbye to my friend Emily. 
um, even though she's not going to be gone forever. So uh, she's going to be in convent. Um, but I want to say uh, thank you for the last year. Uh, it's been a great year to being your friend. Um, and I hope and know that God has a great plan for you and that uh, you'll be doing great work uh, for Our Lady and for our Lord and with the Dominican sisters. And uh, maybe one day we will be um, brother and sisters uh, with the Dominican order. We'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, and uh, thank you very much for your friendship. And uh, may we both grow closer to God um, and that everything we do, may it all be for the glor- greater glory of God. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you to her family, to her mom and her dad, uh, to all her siblings, um, especially the, uh, the the younger siblings. Um, that they were a lot of. That was very grateful. I'm great, very grateful for all the fun that we had and for um, the hospitality that I was I received. It was uh, like being at home. It was very very nice. Uh, so thank you very much again, and uh, God bless. <laughs>